Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in today for a very special preview walkthrough of our exhibition on Souza, The Power and Glory, The Power and the Glory that is curated by Ranjit Hoskote. The exhibition opens tomorrow. So this is a sneak peek into the exhibition with the curator. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank Ranjit for curating this exhibition for us. We are actually opening, reopening after uh, almost two years after the pandemic. And uh, so we're very excited to open with this particular exhibition uh, because it's an exhibition I think that um, provides a very interesting approach to an artist who we are all extremely familiar with. And um, I think like a lot has been written and said and a lot of exhibitions have been held on Suza's work. But I think this exhibition is quite different and quite apart from the other exhibitions that have been done on his work before, because um, it also provides a historical context to Souza's work, um, you know, kind of encompassing a larger social, religious, and political realities that uh, Souza was kind of um, imbibing and kind of uh, critiquing. So it's not really looked at as just. Souza as a rebel and you know it, it goes it moves from the personal to the political kind of looking at his work uh, with very significant moments in art history and not only actually art history but also um, you know political and social events that were happening around that time so I think in that sense um, the, um, the kind of exhibits and the way that Ranjit has curated this exhibition is to bring together not only very significant works from our own collection, the JNF collection, but also from the CSNBS Museum. So there's a selection of uh, Christian religious objects, Indo-Portuguese objects from Goa, which is where Sousa was from. In addition, we also have objects, uh, we also have paintings from Sousa's contemporaries, as well as a little section on a little art historical context and the significant moments that shape some of the very interesting works that you will see shortly. So um, I just want to thank Ranjit, also uh, Dadiba Pandol for lending us some of the works and the CSM West Museum. So without wasting more time, I will hand it over to Ranjit. Let's go there. Ceremony. Yes. <laughs> Thanks so much. Pooja, thank you so much. For your, for your gracious uh, and very generous welcome. And I'd also take this opportunity to thank the John Gary Nicholson Art Foundation, its trustees, Cyrus Gazdar and Kevan Kalyaniwala, as well as Team JNAF, um, Pooja Vesh, Tamara Raskina, Kartik Maivanshi, and Ashika Kune. It's been a real pleasure to work with all of them and to realize this exhibition, which, as Pooja just said, visits a major figure in the pantheon of uh, post-colonial Indian art. But we decided that this was a good moment, as we reopened the museum and the gallery, to tease out a certain dis a distinct history from which Sousa emerged, and which tends to get lost in the larger narratives and paradigms of the progressive artists group, or modern Indian art, which tends on the whole to be based and biased on an understanding of British India. You know, when we say post-colonial India, we tend to think only of British India. What tends to be lost from view are the very specific journeys to the modern that took many Indians uh, through a Lusophone route in Goa, Daman, and Diu, and a Francophone route in Pondicherry and Mahe, for instance. So this is part of the historical background that we're teasing out here. And I'll begin more or less at the beginning with the painting on which this show really stands. It's one of Sousa's key and legendary works, but it's been rarely exhibited. And I'd like you first, all of you to see it. It's called Death of a Pope. It's an oil on canvas from 1962. And uh, whenever it's been written about with some exceptions who have seen very clearly the politics of it, it tends to be seen as part of Sousa's larger adversarial relationship to authority, to patriarchal figures, 
to priests, to capitalists, and so forth. But there's a much more detailed and precise history that hangs off of this painting. And when we look at it, it reminds us that whilst a painting may well be worth a thousand words, sometimes a painting taken out of its context really does not release or reveal itself uh, as fully as it could if you knew what it meant in its own time horizon. This painting, as we discovered in the process of researching and preparing this exhibition, is actually based on a photograph, which we'll come to later, a news photograph that circulated widely in October 1958, uh, showing the final rituals attending the passage of Pope Pius XII. When Pope Pius XII died in 1958, he took with him a papacy that had been tainted by a close relationship with the Nazi regime. Through the Reichskonkordat that he had signed with the Nazi regime, Pope Pius had in effect tolerated its excesses and its outrages. It's also true that he helped, he and his, and his colleagues helped uh, victims of the Nazi regime to survive and to escape. But by and large, this was a papacy that was eclipsed by, by, these, by these treaties. What happens after the death of Pius XII is a completely different horizon in the Catholic Church. His successor, John XXIII, as many of you will doubtless know, inaugurated a period of great self-scrutiny and reform in the church. Through the process of Vatican II, uh, the Roman Catholic Church opened up to Latin America, to Africa, and to Asia, where in fact, uh, the greater proportion of Catholics lived and continue to live. There was an openness to the cultures of these continents. There was a process of inculturation by which the church grew less Eurocentric. And there was an embrace of the, the emerging forms of theology and thinking in these continents and their societies. So that's in one sense, the backstory to this, to this painting. And of course you see how what should have been a solemn occasion becomes in Sousa's handling, a moment of grim satire. The Pope is presented in a rather irreverent manner. His colleagues are monstrous. And although they're involved in a high rite and ritual, it is as though they were presiding over something that is demonic. And this interplay between the divine and the demonic is something that was really part of Sousa's growing up years. He was born in Saligão in Goa, which was at that point still in the Portuguese empire in 1924. His first five or six years were spent there. And uh, then he moved with his mother, his father died very early. He moved with his mother to Bombay, but the impress of those years was very, very strong. So what we've tried to do in this exhibition is to be true to the, to the presence of Sousa in the Nicholson collection, where the focus is really very much on, a, on the period from 1957 to around the late 1960s. That horizon, Sousa in the 60s, actually has a number of lessons for us. So if on the one hand, he deals with formal religious subjects through the optic of satire, what he tends to do in landscapes like these, landscape in red, landscape in green, is to recover the love of the land, the, the presence of the landscape, and in many of his, oh, this was really the Goa of his childhood. So here, for instance, now remember that by 1961, Goa, uh, Sousa is in London already. So even if works like these refer to, to English or to European situations, behind them and inspiring them always is the memory of Saligon, where he grew up. So when I look at a work like this, I can't help but feel that that chromatic inspiration comes from what in Konkani is spoken of as Goen Chitambri Mati, the laterite red soil of Goa, which Sousa often recurred to as something that had remained with him through his transcontinental migrations. Uh, when he painted this, he was in London. By the end of the 60s, he would move on to New York. And yet the, this, this incredible early experience of Goa remained a source of psychic energy, of violence, but also of passion and of love. So it's in that spirit that we have here these two magnificent landscapes by Sousa. And then we move also in this part of the exhibition to Sousa's handling of the portrait, where even if it's a perfectly secular subject like a woman, you'll see that 
its armature comes from iconography. You see that behind it is the Romanesque, behind it is also Byzantine iconography. That is the language of image making from which a portrait like this emerges. And as Gita Kapoor wrote in a marvelous still landmark essay called The Devil in the Flesh from the late 1970s on Sousa, when he handled the still life, it is as if he imbued it with the sacred. So, and as Gita says in a memorable phrase, his still lives become studies of liturgical objects. So if you look at something like this, it seems to be some fairly everyday secular objects, but look more closely and they remind you of the Eucharist, of Holy Communion, of Koinonia, the table of fellowship that Jesus invites his apostles to sit around. And that is the contradiction and the paradox of Sousa, that on the one hand, he was this iconoclastic figure who criticized religion. And yet in unexpected ways, he seeks spirituality. He seeks to find some sort of relationship with the cosmos, even if it's, the, if it's through something as modest as, you know, a bottle of wine and a few fruits on a table. Meanwhile, Sousa's sense of the human being remains violent. It is, it is an awareness of the instinctual drives, the, the aggressiveness, the antagonism that seems to be part of the human adventure. So at some point pretty early in the day, he arrived at a form of the head of figuration that was scarred by private anguish, by historical suffering. So when you look at something like this, which is called face, you find that it is almost like a cyborg. There's uh, there's a human element, there's also a robotic element, there's a great deal of, of almost perverse violence that leaps out of the frame. And what is amazing is that even though many of us are used to this notion of Sousa, confronting a work like this yet is, is an amazing experience of renewing that fear and terror and shock. And at this point, I, I find it interesting that his very hopeful and optimistic parents gave him two intriguing names. On the one hand, he was named for the saint who embodied compassion and a sense of communion with all living things, St. Francis. And his second name, Newton, refers to the last of the alchemists who was the first of the scientists, Isaac Newton. And it's curious that these are two very powerful strands in, in Sousa's life and work. On the one hand, this sense of living among the saints, even if against them. And on the other hand, a certain experimental ability to deal with new materials. And I'll come to that in a minute. I wanna dwell here briefly on the deeper historical horizon of our show here. This is a selection, this and several other vitrines that we have uh, present uh, uh, images in polychrome wood and ivory particularly, also other materials from a Christian iconography that was made largely in the Ishtadoda, India, in Goa, Daman, and Diu. And this is, as Pooja said, from the collection of the CSMVS. Working in a museum environment allows us to really pull clear of the constraints of the gallery system at large. Here we are able to work with multiple horizons, multiple typologies of object, and to really create a transhistorical context, such as this one, where you see that even if Sousa was preeminently a 20th century artist, he lived after all from 1924 to 2002, his understanding of the 20th century was saturated in and richly informed by this religious imagination, which comes to us from the Flemish Baroque, from the Italianate Baroque, from the developments in Catholic iconography in Iberia in the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries. So when you look at say John the Baptist here, or Mary Magdalene here, or St. Sebastian, remember that all of these figures are alive and real to Sousa in his imagining, even if they get translated into strange and virulent forms. And what we've also done in, in our attempt to create multiple horizons for Sousa, because remember that presenting an artist as a solo performer is not really helpful eventually. This may work well in some contexts, but it's always more enriching for all of us as viewers to see them in the rich receding landscape of which they were a part. Who else was at work? What were they reading? What were they looking at? I think a viewerly curiosity about these things actually helps us understand better 
the solitary artist is not so solitary. So here, for instance, we have works by his contemporaries and friends. This is Akbar Padamsi, a lithograph. And this is a work by Krishan Khanna, which is called Betrayal, which is, of course, the case of Judas. So how does Christian imagery, how does the figure of Christ continue to inform that whole generation? This is something that we're curious about and we would like to know more about and we would invite our viewers into the space of questioning. So Akbar's figures, although they're rarely named or titled, they certainly draw on the imagery of the saints and the martyrs. And Krishna, of course, has always, for a long, long period, been preoccupied with Jesus, with the episodes in the Gospels. And there are a series of fantastic works that he's produced over the decades, which address these subjects. And so we plunge deeper into the show. There are, as you see, more of the, the historical referent, reference points. And then there's a set of works here, which Sousa referred to as, as his chemical paintings or his chemically altered works, which were made really in New York. Uh, he moved from London to New York at the end of the 60s, in 1967. And uh, there inaugurated what you might want to think of as the Newtonian side of his doings. Uh, a, a consideration of what you could do through a combination of the found and the made. So he would pull uh, pages out of glossy magazines and then manipulate them, work over them. Sometimes he would bleach them. Sometimes he would make graffiti like drawings over them, work with solvent. And um, critics and curators like Nancy Adijania have seen that in the frame of uh, the, the experiments with chemicals that were going on say with Robert Rauschenberg. Uh, in that same decade. Uh, Sousa's daughter, Shelley Sousa, has written beautifully and movingly of how through works like these, Sousa achieved a form of painting without paint. And we also wanted our viewers to have a sense of this. This collection comes from the Pandol family collection. We're really grateful to them for having uh, joined us in this adventure. It rounds off our story of Sousa in, in the 60s. Sometimes you can achieve this through a vast retrospective, sometimes as here through a more contemplative, more intimate kind of exhibition. And uh, over in this part of the show also, we have um, a major work like Mammon, which is also for us a way of thinking about Sousa's uh, preoccupation with biblical imagery, the biblical text, because Mammon, as everybody knows from the New Testament, from the Sermon on the Mount, is the opposite of the divine in, in Christ's thinking. And Jesus, of course, says in the Sermon on the Mount that you cannot serve God and mammon at the same time. So when you look at this figure of mammon, the god of wealth and oppression, uh, you're also thinking about how Sousa came to this from his left-wing uh, perspective on life. Remember that early on, he had been influenced by the progressive writers group. That is where he got the idea of naming his confreres, the progressive artists group. So there was a certain, uh, if you will, critique of the forms of accumulation and capital. Uh, also alongside this, you might want to think about his set of caricatures from 1955, uh, Six Gentlemen of Our Times. So we are also pointing to the caricatural elements that underlie what eventually become works like this, which endure beyond their particular horizon. So as viewers, we also shuttle between the particularity and granularity of a work and the context from which it emerges. And what we've also tried to do here out of our commitment to multiple publics is to have all of the didactics of our exhibition in three languages. So there's English, there's Marathi, and there's Hindi. So there are literally 30 texts that the 10 texts in English have been translated. I also want to put out a shout out to our translators here, uh, Prasanna Mangrulkar, Manisha Soman, and Sandhya Vakil, who've uh, really uh, worked closely with us to render these texts, not in a mechanical way, but in a persuasive and elegant manner for readers in each language. And um, over here, I'm not gonna say more because I'm hoping you'll actually come and see this show. This is what we call the context wall, which offers a sense of uh, the, the art historical milieu from which works like these emerge. So you have, for instance, uh, 
again, Krishan Khanna and Akbar Padamsi in the Indian part of Souza's life, but also works by Francis Bacon, who was his contemporary in the time when he was actually seen as a British artist. Remember that Souza also had a life and a documented life in criticism as a British artist through the 50s and 60s. So you could contextualize his work vis-a-vis -vis the work of Francis Bacon, Working backwards, Velasquez, El Greco, I'm going to leave the rest to when all of you visit here. And if we go around here, uh, there are many ways of reading this exhibition, of course, but I'll end here because I began with the painting, Death of a Pope. I'll end with the photograph on which it's based. This is something that emerged from our research. This is the photograph on which the painting is based. It was widely circulated in the media at the time. And it's among the early examples of how an Indian artist referred to media images, media circulations, to work with, radically rework and translate uh, an image. So this is now archival, if you can find it, the painting endures for all time and speaks to its moment and beyond. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>